Hello and welcome to People and Profit, the business show that's always a good investment. Coming up, has the shine gone off gold? Prices have dropped in recent weeks, so what does that mean for gold miners? The world's biggest share price collapse. We look at the story of PetroChina's spectacular fall from stock market grace. And the 90s craze that's back with a bang. But will Tamagotchis last longer this time around? We're starting, though, with gold, the classic safe haven asset. In times of crisis, it's where investors put their money. As a result, gold prices often track global political events closely. Now, after a volatile year, prices have declined for the past two months. That's down to a range of factors, including increased optimism about the global economy and the potential of higher interest rates. It's by no means a slump, though. Gold prices are now only slightly lower than they were this time last year. So how does all of this affect gold miners? Well, to talk about this, I'm joined in the studio by Mzee Kamalo, who is the chairman of Metallon, which has four gold mining companies in Zimbabwe. It's one of your many business interests, but I'd like to start with this one, if I may. How does the change in gold price affect the gold mining industry? Is it completely immune to any sort of change in effect? Well, those gold mining industry companies and the industry that is well run, because the trick here, the, the volatility in this business is worse than anything else. So the trick here is to just manage your cost. Keep your cost as low as possible, as low as practically possible. We no longer live in the world of safe heaven. The inflationary pressures of the world, for some reason, have been contained even with quantitative easing all over the world. The inflation has remained low. So people don't have to run to gold anymore. But I think for as long as gold is above 1,100, a lot of companies will, will manage. Do you see the demand for gold being maintained? Do you think we could go below that level of 1,100? Is that likely? <sighs> Nobody predicts anything about gold. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to predict anything, but it's highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely that uh, they, there is a level, and I don't, off the top of my mind, I wouldn't know when is the cutoff, but there are certain levels where if the gold price went maybe to 900, half the um, mining companies, the gold mining companies in the world will close and then the demand will push it back up. So that's, that's what I think. I talked there about some of your business interests in Zimbabwe. It's a country that's often described as being one that's very difficult to do business in. Uh, what's been your experience and what continues to motivate you to invest in the country? I've been in Zimbabwe for the last 15 years. Uh, we have about 10 million ounces of gold there. So I'm not going to walk away from that. You know? So whatever we produce in Zimbabwe, we're reinvesting it in the country. It is a very difficult environment, uh, largely because of uh, cash shortages. Uh, after the hyperinf hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, the country virtually collapsed, and they adopted a multi-currency, which pushed all the prices up. So it is an expensive country to do business, uh, difficult environmentally, uh, but it works. It works. So it's about the approaching these things with, a, I suppose, a particular attitude to be able to succeed in an environment like Zimbabwe? That's correct. How does it compare to the other countries that you operate in in Southern Africa? Because you have businesses in several countries. DRC and Tanzania would be much better, much more, I think, even the perception other people will say DRC is worse with corruption and this. It's six of the other and half a dozen of the other, you know. It's just depends. You have to understand what you are doing and understand your environment and have a positive attitude. The mining industry in general has been very vulnerable to changes in commodity prices over the past couple of years. It, we've seen huge incidents affecting mining companies in South Africa, for example. Do you feel the industry is getting back on its feet now as prices are starting to recover? Yeah, definitely. Definitely the industry is getting back on its feet. Hey, remember, there was uh, not too long ago, 13 years ago, the gold price was 300. Especially uh, the industry was on its knees. Uh, it's now at uh, 1,260. The costs have gone up. But it's profitable. It's a very profitable industry at the moment. Now, in your own life as well, you once were in prison at the same time as Nelson Mandela and Robben Island. How did that inform your business career since then? It creates a sense of resilience. It creates a sense of uh, 
inner optimism. Uh, we become very, things can look very bleak and very dark and you say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to come light, you know. If you survive prison and you survive apartheid and eventually you triumph over it, you can overcome anything. In addition to that, it creates, uh, you know, I'm in business in all these dangerous countries and difficult countries because we just want to make a social impact. You want to do things that create a long-term improvement, a long-term change in people's lives. Mining industry in its nature create and they facilitate the building of infrastructure, the proper management of that infrastructure. Because if you've got coal or gold or anything, you need energy, you need industrial water, and um, you need a lot of workers. So we create towns and cities out of the mining business. If you have bulk commodities, you have to have uh, rail, ports, uh, because you have, eventually you have to take this thing out. So in the mining industry, we're the ones who provide electricity. So you start, you have to create electricity for yourself. If there is no grid, you have to create the national grid and sell the surplus to the government. That's how historically mining companies have behaved and performed. Um, it's difficult now. Uh, it's just that it's a very political business. Small, because really the mining industry is probably, what, less than 2% of the world GDP? But of course we make out as though we're very important, you know, <laughs> and most government thinks we are. But you're not as big as most other industries are. And are you optimistic for the future of the industry? I am optimistic in the short to medium term. In the long term, mining assets, commodities are depleting assets. Just like America, they were once the largest gold producers in the world, the largest coal producer, they ran out of it. So wherever you are mining, whatever you're doing, eventually it's going to come to an end, it will run out. So I think in the short term to medium term, yes. In the long term, we'll have to find a way to migrate the skills that we use, the infrastructure into other areas. That's basically what it is. Okay, MZ Kamalo, thank you very much for coming in to speak to us. It's absolute, absolute pleasure for me. Now, next, 10 years ago, PetroChina became the world's first ever trillion dollar company. But since the oil and gas giant began trading on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, its fortunes have gone downhill. Having lost 80% of its value, it now represents the biggest stock collapse in history. Analysts say it hasn't yet reached rock bottom. So what has happened to PetroChina? Kate Moody's been finding out. Kate. Well, Stephen, on November 5th, 2007, the state-owned PetroChina hit the Shanghai Stock Exchange with a splash, surpassing $1.2 trillion in value on its first day of trading and briefly becoming the world's most valuable company. But shares have since plunged, wiping $800 billion off of its market value. So what happened? In addition to the global financial crisis, PetroChina was hit by a shift in policy as Beijing clamped down on market speculation. The price of oil has dropped by about half over the past decade, and there's been a global move towards more sustainable fuel sources. Now, that's not to say that business is all bad. PetroChina's most recent earnings report showed quarterly profits had nearly tripled. Its listings in Hong Kong and New York have fared better than its domestic shares, there have been management changes at its parent company, and PetroChina holds a near monopoly of China's natural gas reserves. That could be key to its future. The firm's gas production has nudged up while oil output drops. It wants natural gas to account for half of its business by the end of this decade. It also owns nearly all of the major gas pipelines in China, which it could spin off into a separate unit to raise money. Now, as a state-owned company, PetroChina's fate lies in Beijing's hands. It could suffer from deals to import cheap gas from around the world, and its stocks remain expensive, over 30 times its estimated earnings. According to a Bloomberg survey of market analysts, the collapse is far from over. Shares could lose a further 16% in the coming year. Stephen? Kate, thank you very much for that. Now, turning next to the return of a craze from the 1990s that many thought was long dead. The Tamagotchi is back on sale in France and it's become a collector's item for old and new fans of the digital pets. Alexander Alcott reports. 
An hour before the shop opened, there was already a long queue of people desperate to get their hands on a Tamagotchi once more. This is a collector's edition for the 20th anniversary, a re-release of the version from 1997. The new one is almost identical to the original and offers a nugget of nostalgia to people now in their early 30s. And once the shop doors open, there was a rush to grab one. Among the customers was this man who didn't want to reveal his identity, as he'd lied to his boss inventing a death in the family to get the day off work. But for him it was unthinkable to miss out on the return of the Tamagotchi. For a first experience looking after an animal, it's not bad. It was tough in class and sometimes I woke at night to find out it had died or done a poo. It wasn't easy. And with such high demand, they were completely sold out in just 15 minutes. The Tamagotchi was invented in Japan, where it was designed to replace real pets in a country where space is scarce. This young woman, Aki Mehta, came up with the idea for the virtual animal. It was an immediate success and was soon being sold on the black market for 20 times its original asking price. 75 million units have been sold around the world in the past 20 years. There have been re-releases and improvements. Around the year 2000, there were Tamagotchis that could interact. So, yes, there have been improvements. And even if the virtual animals all die eventually, if they catch on with a new generation, the Tamagotchi could be set for a resurrection. That's it from us for this week, but you can always contact the team on social media with your thoughts. On Facebook, you'll find us at France24Business, or you can tweet me at NewStephen. Until next time, thanks for watching.